Okay, so this lecture is on some fundamentals of marine biology, which is salt water or seawater. Um, so we're going to talk about the components of water, which make it a biologically important molecule, as well as um, the molecule which is able to dissolve all these salts. And then we're also going to talk about the sea floor, and including large scales. We're going to talk about tectonics, plate tectonics, um, and also the different sections of the ocean, what we call the seafloor, and the different sections. All right, so we're going to start with a little bit about ge geography. So we've got these major uh, bodies of water throughout the world, which we call oceans. And there are four of them, Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic. You should know these, of course, from looking at a map. Uh, we also have the Southern Ocean, um, which will sometimes be referred to. But this is um, what surrounds Antarctica, but is also the just the southern part of the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic Ocean. Um, so the Earth didn't always have water on it. Uh, originally, the Earth, um, you know, was just a solid, um, solid mass. You know, it didn't have water, and the water came from actually these comets, which pelted the Earth for million, millions of years, constantly. Um, and comets are made of ice, and so when that ice then hit the Earth, it melted, formed bodies of water. When lots and lots and lots of comets hit it, then you have um, the formation of these oceans. And because of our the relative position of the Earth in relation to the Sun, um, it's provided an opportunity for that water or that ice to melt and, and continue to be in a liquid form. So the Earth itself, and this is important to plate te tectonics and... Um, why uh, the Earth is as it is and how these plates move. So it's made of three separate parts. First you have the core, and that's this inner orange part, and there's two orange parts to it, mostly made of iron. Okay, and then you have the mantle, you have an upper and lower mantle here, kind of the pinkish part. Uh, and then the last part is the red um, crust, oceanic and continental parts. The uh, crust is the thinnest layer and uh, the lower mantle is not static, it is um, flowing um, currents of um, melted and very hot um, rocks essentially. Okay, so um, if we break the earth down into these um, plates, uh, these outer layers, we have um, one part which is going to have the ocean on it, which is our oceanic crust, another part which is our continental, which does not have the ocean on it. Oceanic crust is our more newer formed um, crust layer, and it is generally more dense and will sink below a continental crust when the two meet. Um, so it is less than 200 million years old, whereas the continental crust, being less dense and older, can be as old as 3.8 3 billion years old. Now, uh, the Earth itself and these continental plates and oceanic plates are not static. They aren't staying in the same place, but they are slightly moving, and uh, although very little, um, in in you know human terms, it is enough over millions and millions of years to um, see significant differences in where they are positioned uh, along the Earth's crust. So continental drift or the movement of these continental plates was first proposed by Alfred Wegener in 1912, and he suggested that once upon a time all these continents formed a supercontinent called Pangaea. Okay, and you can see just by looking at them, yeah, they do look like they fit together at one point. At the time, it was not widely accepted because the evidence for it had not been gathered, but um, it now has evolved into a science called plate tectonics, where we have a, a, number, of cont uh, a number of plates on the surface, okay, and they're outlined in red here in this figure, that are constantly moving slightly in different directions. See the arrows pointing here. Some of, and, and where they meet, they 
some of them sink underneath other ones. Um, and these are fueled by convection um, currents, which are these uh, diagrammatic currents here formed by these red arrows that are constantly circling. When they circle, they move the outer crust. Um, and if they're moving in opposite directions, you know, they'll cause those crusts to move, uh, bump into each other or to form new crusts at a you know, ridge where they are separating away from each other. So heat from the mantle causes these convection currents, which causes these crust layers to move in different areas. So Pangaea uh, was once surrounded by a single world ocean, Penthalacia, and the Tethys Sea was uh, another large body of uh, seawater, but was kind of almost landlocked by um, parts of Eurasia and Africa. Okay, and that was it. It was just one ocean. But, um, and these were last in place about 200 million years ago. But we um, saw some separation from all these different plates because they're all moving different directions. And as the Atlantic Ocean started to grow, the Pacific um, Ocean is oops, starting to sink, uh, shrink. Um, and you had separation of Eurasia and Africa and North and South America. So um, this is a figure showing, again, we had Pangaea 190 million years ago. Uh, 150 million years ago, you started to see rifts between some of the plates, uh, continental plates. Eventually, they all separated into our different continents. Uh, however, India kind of migrated across the Indian Ocean and then hit up with Asia later. Um, and till, till about 15 million years ago, which is when we have kind of our current state, although the Atlantic Ocean again is still growing and Pacific um, is still shrinking. So we have marine sediments, which are, you know, compositions of rock generally uh, or sand. And there are two different types. Lithogeneous sediments are derived from the breakdown of rocks, so weathering uh, currents or are splashing uh, waves onto the, the margin. Um, and we have biogenous sediments, which are the accumulation of you know, shells, for the most part, shelled invertebrates. And these will form, over time, um, other sediment structures or rock structures, such as um, limestone, which is uh, the compilation of millions and millions of years of marine organisms and their shells all compact together. Or volcanic activity can also form um, new rock which can be weathered down into sediments as well. Alright, so the two points at which you have, or the point at which you have two um, plates coming together, a continental plate and a oceanic plate, you have what's called a margin. Okay, and these generally have four parts. The continental shelf, which is the shallow area. The shelf break, where it goes into a more steep continental slope. And then a continent, continental rise, where you have kind of the accumulation of sediments as they fall down the slope. The continental shelf, that first shallower area, makes about 8% of the ocean surface. And it is the biologically most biodiverse, or most species rich. That is because you have the transect of um, ocean floor and the penetration of light. So it allows for photosynthesis and has all these nutrients uh, cycling to allow for lots of life. It varies in width from one kilometer to 750 kilometers and the shelf ends at the shelf break which occurs at a depth of 120 to 400 meters. The continental slope then can be thought of like kind of the edge or you might kind of fall off into the deep sea. Um, it begins at the shelf break and continues to the deep sea floor, and it's much steeper than the continental shelf. Um, the continental rise then, like we said before, you have sediments gathering at the bottom of the um, slope. And kind of think of it as an underwater river delta, where instead of it being water, it's being sediments that are gathered there and formed. There are two different types of margins, uh, depending on whether 
you are at a margin where things are growing or separating or where they are coming together. A passive margin is relatively inactive and we see this on the Atlantic Ocean and the East Coast. It's characterized by flat wide shelf um, and <clears throat> continental shelves that gradually slope. Um, and then the other side of the continent on the west coast we have active margins and these are generally geologically active with lots of volcanoes and, um, and mountains and uh, this is where you, you basically have them growing towards each other the continental and um, oceanic plates um, and so they have a much steeper slope little or no shelf at all. Um, it's very rocky on the on the continental side whereas on the passive side it's usually very sandy. Alright so that's it for um, the sea floor. Now we're going to talk about sea water starting with water. So water is made of two hydrogen and one oxygen um, atom. The oxygen and the hydrogens do not share electrons evenly, which means that that they are polar, which means that it has part of it that is partly negative and other parts which are partly positive. And what this does is those negative parts and those positive parts are attracted to each other and form this weak bond called a hydrogen bond. And these hydrogen bonds give the properties of water that make it unique as something that um, can sustain life. So we're going to go over those properties. So first off, co cohesion um, is caused by these hydrogen bonds forming between water molecules, causing them to stick to each other. So that's why water, you know, is generally um, all together. Adhesion is water sticking to other things. So if you take a drink from your straw and then you, after you're done drinking, you look at your straw, you can see water is sticking to the sides of the straw. That would be adhesion. These uh, hydrogen bonds are relatively weak, but there are so many of them, they're constantly being made, that it makes water a good solvent. So they're able to um, have things dissolve within them, such as salts, um, um, polar substances, and then small things such as gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, which are important for life as well. Water also absorbs heat. Um, very good at it and which is why when you like pour water in your hand and then dry it off if it's still wet you can it feels kind of cold because that water is 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 pulling heat away from your hands um, this can become a challenge for organisms that need to stay warm such as marine mammals all right water is the only element or the only substance on earth that can be found in all three states in different parts of the earth, so it could be ice, water, and um, vapor. And it has the unique um, property of being less dense as a solid, so it floats on top of liquid water as ice. Um, cold water also holds more oxygen and nutrients than warm water, so generally cold water is more productive. And uh, when it changes states, we have terms for those. So from water to water vapor, we have evaporation. From water vapor to water, it's condensation. From water ice, it's freezing. So like I said before, water is a great solvent. It dissolves lots of things. Um, those things that are dissolved within it are called solutes. Um, and we measure the amount of things within water, and we call it its salinity. Generally, the salts that are most abundant are sodium and chloride, especially in seawater. And this is measured in parts per thousand. Most seawater is about 35 um, parts per thousand, which means it has 35 grams of salt for every 1,000 grams of water. So these are the concentration of the different things. Again, you can see sodium and chloride are about 85% of the total salinity of the total things being dissolved in seawater. And then you have a um, compilation of a bunch of other charged particles or ions found within seawater as well. 
ocean water near a point where a, miver, a river meets it. So like you have the river here coming and emptying into the Gulf of Mexico. Generally right here, this is fresh water, which has a very low salinity. So that's going to affect the salinity of this area here. So this may have a lesser than 35 parts per thousands, such as 15 to 25. And then as you go further and further away from it, it'll go closer and closer to 35. Other areas may have um, increased um, salinity, such as the Great Salt Lake, which has a lake which doesn't have any outlet. So there's no place for the salt to go. Uh, and so salt accumulates in the Great Salt Lake. Um, it can range from anywhere from 50 to 270 parts per thousand, depending on you know, how much it has rained or snowed and emptied into it. The Dead Sea is the saltiest sea on Earth, and it can have a salinity of 337 parts per thousand, which also makes things more buoyant. So if you've ever been in the Salt Lake or the Dead Sea, uh, you can float relatively easily. All right, water also will uh, absorb light rather quickly, unlike air where it passes through very easily. Um, and different colors actually will transmit or be absorbed at different depths. Okay, so, and this transparency, transparency is also affected by the amount of solutes or sediments within the water as well. So in Hawaii, there's not a lot of rivers, so there's not a lot of sediments being dumped into the ocean, so it is very clear. Whereas in California, Oregon, you have lots of inputs of water, lots of input of um, of sediments and so it's more murky and less clear so you can't see as far in it. Red is generally the first to fade out which is why you see in a deep sea organisms they are generally either have no color at all or red because red has already been absorbed in the water and is basically like being not visible at all. So if you are red, that's the same as being uh, no color at all. Whereas when you look at um, coral reefs, which are found in more shallow waters, they have all the different colors of the rainbow, much more um, apparent. All right, conditions uh, within different depths are very, very different within the ocean, um, uh, including how much oxygen is found at different depths, including uh, in fact, there is one area in which there is almost no oxygen found. Um, temperature changes and salinity changes. Pressure, of course, changes. For every 10 meters, you get about one atmospheric increase of pressure. So the amount of pressure you fear, feel at the sea surface is one atm um, ATM. 10 meters, you're at two. Another 10, you're at three, and so on and so forth. So these things, all these conditions vary depending on depth. All right, so there are um, ways in which the ocean just uh, moves around, right? It doesn't stay static. And these circulation patterns occur as waves, tides, currents, and gyres, okay? Waves are at the surface, tides are at the margins, Currents can be found at the surface or um, deep underneath, and those are called gyres. The circulation within the ocean is significantly dri driven by wind patterns at the surface. Okay, and wind patterns are affected by the spinning of the earth and uh, solar energy, so the warming of the ocean or the warming of the air because of sunlight. So here are the major surface currents of the ocean. You can see generally they run together at some areas, they will run into each other. And they are around the equator where you have solar energy at its greatest. And then they create these circular currents. All right, waves are the result of wind and fetch. Fetch is the amount of open water a wind blows over before it gets to the um, margin. The crest is the high point of the wave. The trough is the low point of the wave. 
and the wavelength is the distance between two crests or two troughs. Uh, and the wave period is the time it takes for a wave to pass by a set point. So uh, from this crest, when this crest reaches that crest um, where that bird is, that would be the wave period. And let's say it takes approximately 15 seconds. That would be the wave period. A crashing wave um, occurs as waves near the shore. Okay, and as it sh nears the shore, you get closer and closer to more shallow water. The bottom of the wave drags along the bottom. This forces waves to slow down and move closer and closer together. Um, eventually, the drag causes the wave to call fall over, and we call this the wave break, and that creates the surf. The surf um, displaces lots of sand and and can you know weather down rocks and things and affect the organisms living there. Currents, as we mentioned before, are also caused by wind. They can be deep or surface. The Coriolis effect is the deflection of wind caused by the spinning of the earth. And gyres are the circular pattern due to the Coriolis effect. Okay, so kind of already talked about that. There are layers within the ocean. You have the surface layer from zero to 200 meters stays well mixed most of the year because of temperature currents. The intermediate layer from 200 to 1500 meters. And this is where you have the thermocline or the major temperature change. And then from there below 1500 meters, you have the bottom layer. So those aren't very creatively named. Surface, intermediate, and bottom. Downwelling occurs when water sinks due to changes in temperature and salinity. Um, this bring gases, gases from the surface to deep layers and upwelling occurs when you have um, nutrients coming up from the bottom generally comes at, occurs at the march, margins and is generally bringing nutrient rich waters up to the surface so where upwelling occurs you generally have lots of life all right the tides tides are rhythmic rising and falling of sea and surface layer levels due to gravitational effects of the sun and the moon at a high tide, you have waters on the side of the earth closer to the moon. On low tide, waters on the far side of the earth are pushed away. So other factors that can affect include the features of the sea floor. Geographic features also have some gravitational pull, canyons, reefs, and position of the sun. The tidal range is the difference between high and low tide, and this changes daily. Spring tides are when the sun and moon are aligned and the tidal range is greatest. So you have a really high high tide and a really low low tide. Neap tides are when the sun and the moon are not aligned. And neap and low tides affect marine organisms that live in the tidal zone. You can have three different types, semi-diurnal, mixed diurnal, or diurnal. So if you just have one tide throughout the day or one change in tide that's diurnal. This is a mixed semi-diurnal so it's kind of two tides but not a full two tides. Semi-diurnal is where you have a full two tides uh, occurring. And this depends again on position of the sun and the moon and where you are on the earth in relation to each of them. Each of them has a gravitational pull which pulls then the water towards each of them. Okay, so here is um, the Earth's margins and whether they have a semi-diurnal, mixed diurnal, or diurnal tide. Here we're on the east coast. Here we have a semi-diurnal tide. 